No, but it, could it be exculpatory if there's something in there? Uh, maybe. Like the um, Holden report and all that stuff. It's supposed to be like obvious, you know, that there's experts that say it is ritualistic. And they might yeah. have an argument there. Um, so, but we've all seen the crime scene stuff. We've seen the symbols. We've seen the F. Um, I mean, it's definitely up for debate. It's not like this clear, clear thing where you, where it's clear as day. I mean, we're still arguing about it. And me personally, I don't see ruins and I don't see this. Could there be some kind of message there? Possibly, but I just see an unfinished crime scene. Somebody who was startled doing some weird shit and was interrupted. Yeah, because yeah. what, what throws me off is um, the blood sprinkled on them. I mean, it could be spl like splashes from, you know, if he nicked an artery uh, when he was, you know, cutting the neck of one of them. But to make a certain pattern, it's more like that was intentional. Yeah, and a lot of people lately are showing this. Um, somebody who is has a relation to Patrick Westfall where they took their own blood and they drew it looked like almost like a pea mm -hmm. in the tree but you can clearly see like what it is right it's not like there's any splatter there's nothing over here it's like clearly it's a some type of letter um mm -hmm. and when it comes to the delphi crime scene you can't really tell what that is like yeah kind of it's in a shape of an f but then there's like blood over here and there's blood down at the bottom to me it looks more like um libby was cut in the neck she grabbed it leaned against the tree smeared it and then fell backwards hmm. yeah, have you That's seen the crime hands team? were covered i haven't seen the photos no man you never uh, or yeah, us I unless blue's seen. hiding him i have not seen him yeah um we, we we've talked to rick snay who uh says that he's seen him and he's drawn out some pictures of what the crime scene looked like and, and the sticks and the and the position of the bodies it is weird it is interesting now we ha we do have a person who um, watches the channel, watches the show, and they have sent me some things because they are they have ties to um, Norwegian and the Nordic um, symbols and things of that nature. And some of the things that this person was telling me was that you know you can combine um, different type of runes and and the body and stuff like that, and that there definitely does look like maybe not definitely does. Let me rephrase it. There is some similarities there, and some of it may look even backwards which apparently oh man did he disappear yeah well, that's a cha. yeah chat's outside right now <laughs> yeah actually you kind of cut me off earlier uh i said yeah like he oh there, there he, he comes is. he's coming <laughs> I'm just, yeah. went haywire i missed yeah. a okay. minute of what you said sorry about that oh okay okay, okay. So city officials. Bye, Tom. All right, no big deal. Big Blue, what was I saying? Um, shoot, I don't know. I was reading the comments. <laughs> Seriously? Can you help give insight as to whether the killer was trying to make it look Odinistic, quote unquote, and if so, whether he thinks the killer was a legit practitioner or just trying to throw off law enforcement? In my opinion, if this person was under the impression that this is something that needed to be done in the name of Ossetru to the gods or the goddesses, that person would have put a hell of a lot more thought and energy into what was done. There was nothing about from the little diagrams that you would have about how the girls were laying on the ground, the sticks around them. There wasn't a taste in my mouth that that was Ossetru in general. Now, if it was other, some kind of Celtic, Druid, Wiccan, there's nothing about that. It's just like, oh, wow, Ossetru. Pagan in the sense, maybe. The F looking shape kind of looks like a rune a little bit. I guess kinda. But this is kind of looks kind of more like a like a handprint, maybe. I'm not sure. But right here, I mean, like the sharp angle, and then it kind of goes straight down. You know, that F could look like one of the uh, either Anzus or Feiwu. Yeah. Because one of those is an F going up, the other is an F going down. Or that could just be the letter F of the English alphabet that doesn't make it a rune just because it looks like an F. That just could be an English F. I mean, or it could be a handprint. And these don't or, look like runes to you? No. Absolutely not in any way, shape, or form. I don't see runic anything. Uh, upside down. The one you have in the middle, the F thing in the middle. If you turned one of the F runes upside down, and it was merged off or inverted, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, you see? So it'd be still be backwards and upside down, and that's 
that'd be the only thing in that configuration, man, that strikes me as runic in any way. We, we, we've talked to Rick Snay, who uh, says that he's seen him, and he's drawn out some pictures of what the crime scene looked like and, and the sticks and the, and the position of the bodies. It is weird. It is interesting. Now, we, ha- we do have a person who um, watches the channel, watches the show, and they have sent me some things because they, they have ties to um, Norwegian and the Nordic um, symbols and things of that nature. And some of the things that this person was telling me was that, you know, you can combine um, different type of runes and, and the body and stuff like that. There is some similarities there, and some of it may look even backwards, which apparently, oh, man, did he? Upside down. The one you have in the middle, the F thing in the middle. If you turned one of the F runes upside down and it was merged off or inverted, whatever you want to call it, yeah, you see, so it'd be still be backwards and upside down, and that's that'd be the only thing in that configuration, man, that strikes me as runic in any way. Crazy as that. That's like that's like insane in the membrane. Crazy, like like, like this is the membrane. She's inside of it because that's insane. No, like I'm not even kidding you, Amy. That's crazy. Like it puts the lotion in the basket, or else it gets the hose again. Cray to the mother. Cray. Yeah, like if Jay Z had a sister, her name would be Cray. Hey. The Southern Poverty Law Center gets a lot of profit from creating hate groups across the entire country. Mike Peterson says his group with about 10 members in West Michigan has nothing to do with the Nazis. Uh, we consider ourselves a tribe, but basically we are a religious group that follows the religion of Votanism. Okay. Is that a Nazi group? No, it's because a religion. I mean- a religion, he says, that predates Christianity. So you're not part of a white supremacist group, or? Uh, we are not white supremacists. The tattoo on his neck, he says, is not a swastika yeah. spinoff, well, be- but a shield from the side of a Viking ship. That is what this is. This is a shield. In the pose he strikes on his group's page is not, he says, a salute to Hitler, but a workout move. This is what I'm doing right here. And what is that? Uh, it's a workout. Uh, a regime that I follow, and uh, that is the symbol that they, they use. But then there's the mission statement on the Gallows Tree website about race and Aryan values, and the photograph on the webpage showing Peterson next to a man with a giant swastika tattoo on his chest. It's a lot of witch hunting. People like to finger point. That's what it's all about. Peterson uh, served family. nearly nine years in federal prison for arson after setting fire in 1997 to a home on tribal land in Mount Pleasant. The feds extended his parole in 2009 for his alleged involvement with a white supremacist threat group that led to an FBI investigation. Federal prosecutors at the time said his religion promoted, quote unquote, white pride. White supremacy is trying to say, hey, that my people are better than your people. Uh, for some for, for some known reason. I don't think I'm better than anybody. Discuss violent acts in support of their ideology. They used terms that I wouldn't use. They used terms that began with letter N. And from day one, I decided that I would never use that word, even if it created a more dangerous situation for myself. So when I'm with these guys, I'm in that character. I realize that at any moment, I could hear a bang. If you were found out during this operation, recording these conversations, what do you think would happen to you? I'd be murdered, without a doubt. But Moore decided to take that risk anyway. By 2014, he'd become a Grand Nighthawk, or security officer in the KKK. It was then that he was approached by three fellow clan members who were current and former guards at a state prison. They wanted his help to murder a black inmate. One of those guards was Charles Newcomb, the exalted Cyclops of the Florida chapter. Moore alerted his FBI handlers to the plot and began making secret recordings. Eventually, the FBI staged a photo of the inmate's death. Some people choose to continue to contribute to the problem. Some people choose to be part of the solution. 
Moore met up with Nukem at a gas station to show him the stage photo. So I remember actually sitting here waiting for Nukem to pull up. And I was thinking to myself, concentrate on your breathing, keep yourself under control, focus on what you have to do. Don't overthink it. Okay, brother. I do get some of the feelings hearing this video, watching this video, seeing the tree. This tree is that tree. Moore made this secret recording of Nukem's reaction to the fake murder photo. Now, I want to make sure this is that y'all are happy with this and that this is what y'all wanted. Okay? Oh, yeah. Okay. I was asked by the FBI to begin moving towards uncovering more specific law enforcement agencies. However, the public interest and the public safety issue came up with the murder plot and that took a priority. So I know that I was on track to uncover more activity in law enforcement but the immediate threat to the public with the murder plot was a priority and I was only one person. There was only so much I could do. Over the, the ten-year span of my operations I uncovered people that were former military, current military, former law enforcement, current law enforcement, state, local, and county level. Moore says the three current and former prison guards implicated in the murder plot were also actively recruiting new Klan members at the prison. But Florida's Department of Corrections disputes that, telling the AP that the agency found no evidence of wider membership or a systemic problem, and saying in a statement that, quote, any willful breach of our values or participation in illegal activity by FDC staff will result in disciplinary action up to and including dismissal and arrest. That statement by the state is not accurate based on the facts. From where I sat with the intelligence laid out, I can tell you that none of these agencies have any control over any of it. It is more prevalent and consequential than any of them are willing to admit. If you want to know why people don't trust the police, it's because they have a relative or a friend that they witness being targeted by an extremist who happened to have a badge and a gun. And I know as a fact that this has occurred. I stopped a murder plot of law enforcement officers. <laughs> yeah, um, the they are not. Nope. No, no, no. And the vast majority of most people, I'm telling you, it has, to, it takes a lot of like, there's something else going on with people usually with, to deviate to such violence. Um, it's not actually usually the group, but group think can precipitate people with the inclination to act on violence, or oh, it yeah. can also take people who are very vulnerable and force them, because as you were saying, they're probates. One of the ways that you get into the group is you do the dirty work. You do the dirty work for someone else. And a probate typically is like the guys who are at the top are not going to go to prison. Right. They've done their time or they whatever. They keep their hands clean. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it's always, you know, unfortunately, it's usually a lot of younger people <clears throat> that are disillusioned and that go towards gangs. Think about like where, um, like where you need so, like social um, support. And if you kind of have no family or whatever, you're going to, and maybe you get into the system early, great way for them to initiate that contact because they're, especially a young person going to um, incarceration for the first time, that's going to, they're going to immediately grab. In fact, it might be dangerous for them to um, decline um, in certain circumstances. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you guys, you know, prisons. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know you've never been there before and you know <laughs> you, you don't know what it's like and so you know first thing somebody's going to tell you to try and be helpful is got to join a gang you know? and like think about how all gangs kind of uh like emerge they are kind of usually an emer emergence of a um disenfranchised group and yeah this is going to be a group that has been economically disenfranchised and at, like they just don't have the means to sustain themselves as an agricultural community at, at the same caliber like they used to be a very noble posh area it's not exactly a posh area anymore you know um good for you 
Uh, I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the branch of the um, of the like satanic branch of the neo Nazis is the Order of the Nine Angels. If you want to look it up, O nine A. Um, and they practice dark magic instead of light magic, and so that's kind of the deviation there. Yeah. As I understand it, I don't really know it very well, um, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so that there's like those who do good, like white magic or good magic. <laughs> Whereas right. the Order of the Nine Angels, yeah. you do, you want to look something up that's creepy. These are like, th they are some, <laughs> um, but they're mostly online. Um, so, but you remember parasocial spheres is, does play a role now in modern society in things. Yeah. And so it could be very parasocial, this kind of thing. And the most of these people out actually meet each other on things like Discord. And yeah. there are Discords that, um, but there are always going to be those people that are going to seek out others with similar, and it's very, it's very disillusioning. 33 separate racist skinhead chapters nationwide. One of the groups active today is the Vinlanders Social Club. This group's initial purpose was to challenge Hammerskin authority and take its violence to the limits. Even among the most hardcore Vinlanders, Brian Widener stood out for his willingness to inflict pain at a moment's notice. His weapon of choice was a straight racer. He was in the movement for 16 years before he became one of the very few who successfully got out. He has an intimate knowledge of the skinhead culture. For them, it's an all-out war against society, the very people you serve and protect. As co-founder of the Vinlanders, Brian knows full well the violence his former comrades are capable of. Two members of the Vinlanders crew in Arizona were indicted for the drive-by shooting death of a white woman walking with her black boyfriend on a Phoenix street. In 2007, fellow co-founder Eric the Butcher Fairburn and two other Vinlanders were convicted of viciously beating a black homeless man in downtown Indianapolis. Then, in 2010, Fairburn confessed to the murder of a man in Springfield, Missouri. When the victim's wife found him shot to death at her doorstep, she tried to call police, but found that the phone lines had been cut. Fairburn has been sentenced to life in prison. Brian left the Vinlanders and turned his back on the racist scene in 2006. He has gone to great lengths to break free from his past. Today, he is committed to educating people about the dangers of the skinhead lifestyle and to helping law enforcement understand the threats skinheads pose to the public and to police. He offers the following tips dealing with racist skins. How is a skinhead group generally organized? There's not much structure in most skin crews but many do have specific membership requirements that are much like those of an outlaw motorcycle gang. For instance, hammer skins require someone who wants to join their group to be a hangaround for a certain period of time. Then that person becomes a prospect or a probate for up to 18 months. So it could take two years, maybe even a little longer to actually become a full patched member. And as part of the initiation, some crews require that the prospective member commit violence, sometimes against a minority or another person seen as an enemy of the group. So if a skinhead group is adopting the structure and rules of a motorcycle gang, are there other things that the officers should be looking for? Colors and patches, definitely. Uh, more and more skinheads are getting involved in the outlaw motorcycle gangs through criminal activity. Crimes such as trafficking and drugs and guns. Others are becoming members. What should officers be most concerned about when they encounter skinheads? In the skinhead way of life, earning acceptance and respect means brutalizing your enemies. When I was a racist skinhead, I was a walking warning sign for law enforcement. I wore my affiliations on my skin and my clothes. The tattoos, the patches, membership in a group, and connections with an outlaw biker gang. Violence was as right and necessary to me as breathing. So how can an officer know when he's encountered racist skinheads? White laces stood for white power, and the red laces supposedly meant the person who spilled blood for his or her race. Now skins aren't necessarily wearing the traditional clothing and laces. Officers have to work to uncover their ideology. From an officer's safety standpoint, what is the quickest way possible to learn as much as they can if they've encountered skinheads? Check for tattoos. Skinheads are known for their tattoos. These can quickly help officers determine the wearer's beliefs and membership status. Most importantly, they can also reveal the level of dedication and potential for violence. When I was a skin, my tattoos were advertising my history of violence to anyone who knew what they meant. Tell us about your tattoos. What was the meaning of the arrow? The arrow that I tattooed on my face was a Norse rune. Runes are symbol in an ancient alphabet. Each one can stand for a letter or have a certain meaning like life or death. The one I had on my face was the warrior's rune. And in the race of skin culture, it generally signifies the willingness to spill blood for your race. Curtis Alkire, he's accused of murdering a Utah Department of Corrections officer. What's the significance of the emblem there on his cheek? That's a Volksknot. It's typically worn by people who believe in a religion called Odinism, which 
Worships the old Norse gods and goddesses. It is a sign that the wearer is willing to die in battle with his or her enemy at any time. If that happens, the person will get to live in honor among the gods. Are there other specific symbols they should be looking for? Patches. Skinheads who belong to a certain group usually wear a particular patch to show their allegiance. The various factions of Hammerskins all have crossed hammers as the main part of their patches, along with certain other symbols that designate their particular faction. For instance, the Confederate flag is a prominent part of the Confederate Hammerskins patch. Other groups all have their own distinctive patches. These can help officers identify a skinhead's group affiliation. What can an officer learn from this? This tattoo has a lot of important indicators. One, it's a patch. Tattoos of patches, sometimes called meat patches, show the intensity of a member's dedication. Since a member has to give back his patch if he ever leaves the group or gets kicked out, that patch is tougher to remove if it's a tattoo. Number two, the tattoo is not only reveals the wearer's group, but also his membership status. The crossed hammers show that he's a hammer skin, and he's a full-patched member, because all three components of the hammer skin patch are there. The hammers, the half-cog wheel, and the group's colors, red, white, and black. Both the hammer skins and the Vinlanders had patches especially for prospects to wear before they earned full member status. Is there anything else the officer should be aware of? Symbols, like numbers and letters, can sometimes help identify specific beliefs. Um, you can often see the numbers 88 used among white supremacists. H is the eighth letter in the alphabet, so double H stands for HH, that means Hail Hitler. 311 stands for Ku Klux Klan, since K is the 11th letter, and the three means three Ks. Skinheads, like a lot of white power people, often use numbers to indicate a group they belong to without spelling it out. If an officer sees numbers on a skinhead, try to match them up to letters of the alphabet. For instance, 38 stands for CH, or Confederate Hammerskins. 28 can stand for Blood and Honor, another skinhead organization. 5-11 is the Prisgian European Kindred. Numbers can also reveal the skin's religious beliefs. 83 means Hail Christ, which indicates belief in the racist Christian identity religion. Letters can also stand for a specific phrase that indicate a group or a particular belief. HFFH means Hammerskins forever, forever Hammerskins. So, is it significant if a skinhead belongs to a group? Yes. Membership in a group shows a greater commitment to the lifestyle. Once you join, the other members become your brothers, and usually your partners in crime. In fact, most skinhead assaults involve several people, making the attacks more violent. I'm only interested in one thing on this show, which is the truth, trying to figure out the truth, which is what prosecutors should be in, uh, focused on as well. My I'm, just, I'm just talking about whoever did do these murders. I don't know who it was, but it does seem like it was maybe a group of people that it was some sort of ritual at least they wanted to, to make it look like it was a ritual maybe they were trying to like frame it to look like one and it really wasn't i don't know but from the details that we learned it does seem like that there was more than one person so either richard had help or richard was just set up and he's not even involved and it was a group of people who was the group of people i don't know i'm not going to say you know we don't know for sure who it was but it does seem like it there's a good possibility it was more than one person so right here is who in the document they believe to be patrick westfall which it does look like patrick I agree. Painting on the tree. You can't tell what he's painting, so you can't really assume it's an F, but at least it does show that they their ritual does include painting on the tree and pouring things on the tree. So I'm guessing when they pour the water or whatever on the tree, it's probably supposed to symbolize blood, I'm guessing, if it's a ritual, right? So you're telling me that Libby's blood was splattered on the tree, not only with an F, but they made it seem like it was like splattered and then splattered over her. How doesn't that sh like say to these investigators, whoa, this looks like it's a ritual, and it does look like it kind of lines up with this Odinism. Now, like I said, there's a lot of Odinites in Delphi, it looks like, or in Indiana, so they would have to, you know, make sure that they got the right people, but at least look into it. Dang. Okay, so here's all the pictures that I found with Brad and Patrick. So this is from July 27th, 2016. It says, Patrick Westfall and myself have been talking bind runes. What do you guys think? So many possibilities. Okay, so it, this is from August 27th, 2016. It says, Tribe of Gungnir's Path. Had an awesome meeting last night. Thank you all for coming. And the ones who couldn't make it, I can't wait to see you soon. Have a great weekend, everyone. So we have this one from December 18th. It says, hold on a second. I want to go back to that. those runes. I didn't get, I didn't actually look at those clothes. Which ones that he did? Hold on. I just want to see what they are. So we have, uh, I can't believe I didn't, I was so busy, like just, going through and editing that I didn't get a chance to actually look at this. So powerful binding. Let's see, we have, I just want to see if any other ones. Healing, good health. So I want to get into like the specifics of that. Okay. Huh. Pictures that I found with Brad and Patrick. So this is from July 27th, 2016. It says, Patrick Westfall and myself have been talking bind runes. What do you guys think? So many possibilities. 
Okay, so it, this is from August 27th, 2016. It says, Tribe of Gungnir's Path had an awesome meeting last night. Thank you all for coming. And the ones who couldn't make it, I can't wait to see you soon. Have a great weekend, everyone. So we have this one from December 18th. It says, Tribe of Gungnir's Party, Tribal Life, Tribe Matters. Then we have them. It says, Damn good show for the Tribe of Gungnir's Path. That's December 18th also, so the same day. And then we have... January 21st, it says, Affirm 22 Damn Straight. And you can see this one has a location on. It says, Delphi, Indiana. And then there's one more where it says, Hail Thor, Hail the Brotherhood, Hail Patrick Westfall. And that's from January 22nd. So Brad and Patrick are in this one too. So there's Brad. And there's Patrick. So I looked up the tribe of Gungnirs that he mentions in his Facebook post. Like, he's insinuating it. That's their tribe. That's what they're involved in, right? So when you Google that, so Gungnir. In Norse mythology, Gungnir is the spear of the god Odin. It is known for also always hitting the target of the attacker, regardless of the attacker's skill. What could Gungnir do? In addition to being deadly sharp, Gungnir was designed to be perfectly balanced, and it was said that anyone who wielded it would always hit their target, regardless of their skill or strength. So it's like a weapon, right? The spear of God, Gungnir. The spear of Odin, Viking style. Let's see. Norse mythology. So we have Gungnir, Old Norse, pronounced Gungnir. Oh, cool. I was pronouncing it right. Is the name of the mighty spear that belongs to the god Odin. So Gungnir is the weapon most consistently and powerfully associated with Odin. Both poetry and visual art demonstrate that this connection is deep and long-standing. It goes back at least as far as the 9th century. As you would expect, for the weapon of God, Gungnir is no ordinary spear. It was created by the dwarfs, the most skilled smiths in the cosmos, as is related in a tale of how the god's greatest treasures were made. Gungnir is said to have runes carved on its point, which presumably increase its aim and deadliness through magic. We're going to talk about Vinlanders now. So, so here's what they say about that in the document. It says, Patrick Westfall and Brad Holder were both affiliated with Vinlanders Club or gang, along with Johnny Messer. And then it says, as has previously been discussed, Johnny Messer was close with Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall, and also knew Elvis Fields, Ned Smith, and Rod Abrams. Furthermore, as previously discussed, Johnny Messer was a recruiter for Vinlander. Also, as previously stated, Ned Smith, Rod Abrams, and Elvis Fields all hope to join the Villander Club, according to Johnny Messer. So it says around Valentine's 2017, Messer went up there to Delphi to hang out with his Villander buddies. As stated earlier, Patrick Westfall claimed to be at home in Delphi on February 13th, 2017, and Brad Holder claimed to be in Logansport on February 13th, 2017. Therefore, if Johnny Messer was going up there to visit his Villander buddies, he, Johnny Messer, was going to Delphi to spend time with Westfall, who was like Messer's brother or possibly to Logan's Sport to visit Holder. And then one of the, the notes here, it says, Vinlander is a word interchangeable with those that practice Odinism. As State Trooper Roland Purdy stated in his deposition, all members of Vinlanders are also Odinists. Basically, the Vinlanders are a white supremacist group consisting of Odinists. Brad Holder, Patrick Westfall, and Johnny Messer were all affiliated with the Vinlander group. Johnny Messer's ex-girlfriend, Taylor Hornaday, also confirmed that all Vinlanders were also all Odinists. And that Johnny Messer, Brad Holder, and Patrick Westfall were all members of Vinlander. And then it says that Johnny's ex-girlfriend, Taylor, told police that Johnny and Patrick were like brothers. She also told police that she had allowed Johnny to borrow her car on or around Valentine's Day, 2017, and that Johnny drove her car up there to hang out with his Vinlander friends. When he returned her vehicle, it had dry blood over one side of it. Johnny Messer refused to discuss the details of how the blood got there. Johnny Messer's ex-girlfriend further stated that it took her several car washes to finally remove the blood. And then Amber, Brad's ex-wife, said that Brad told her that Westfall belonged to a group called the Vinlanders in 22. Brad told her that Westfall had many people backing him up and powerful friends, she said. And Brad was very nervous while telling her these things and was whispering like he was fearful someone else would hear him. She said throughout the conversation, Brad was constantly telling her to stay away from Westfall. He also told her that Patrick had killed a lot of people and it didn't matter if they were innocent or not. Amber truly believes Brad is scared of Westfall. So we know Johnny Messer was a recruiter for Vinlander. Says Rushville's Johnny Messer recruited for his Vinlander gang all the time. Investigators learned that in the summer of 2016, Johnny Messer was recruiting men that lived in Rushville apartment complex to attend Vinlander meetings. So it's well known that Brad was a Vinlander. Right here, Holder's Vinlander crew. Okay, so now I'll show you what it is to be a member of Vinland or like what they're all about. Here we go. It's a social club it was formed in 2003 by a handful of former members and associates of a rogue racist skinhead group, the Outlaw Hammerskins. Publicly, the Vinlanders appear to be a coalition of independent state skinhead crews 
but in reality, the group functioned as a single entity. The Vinlanders relished a reputation for drinking, brawling, and following a racist version of Odinism, a form of ancient paganism once practiced by Vikings. So this answers the, because so you know how they, they said that Odinism, there is like a racial sect and then like a racist sect, like if there's some that are racist and that's, but in general for Odinism, it's not necessarily racist at all, but there are some that do take like the more racist views, which up until just now, I was like, well, we don't know. Maybe, maybe Brad wasn't the type of Odinite that was the racist type, but he preaches and posts about Vinlanders on his Facebook. At least he did around that time. And that is the group that are racist, at least from what this says, right? A racist version of Odinism. In its own words, our beliefs stem from being deprived of our individual freedoms and from our witnessing of the decline of Western civilization. One of the most obvious and sometimes relevant symptoms of this decline is forced integration and the decline of our towns and neighborhoods based on racial makeup. So co-founder Brain James on the group's website in 2007. We will die fighting together for self-determination and self-respect in a world that has turned its back on natural law and common sense. Let's see, so background. So we have Brian James, Eric the Butcher Fairburn, and Brian Wilner. Nate Slater, Ian Donald Weirich were no strangers to the racist head scene when they formed the Vinlander Social Club in 2003. James Widner and Slater had been members of a head faction called the Outlaw Hammerskins, and Fairburn and Weirich were hangarounds, or associates of the group. Before starting in 2002, the Hoosier State Skinheads, a group that operated out of Indiana and Illinois, they recruited members in Ohio to start a neighboring faction, the Ohio State Skinheads. Though outwardly, it appeared the two groups were separate. In reality, they functioned as a single organization. As more crews were created, they all became part of what became to be known as the Vinlander Social Club. It's saying they were created because they were disappointed with a movement that we dedicated our young lives to, James wrote, that the Vinlanders was to be something that was going to replace and surpass the old guard in the skin scene, even by force if ne necessary. The Vinlanders were formed in large part as a direct challenge to Hammerskin Nation, a coalition of Hammerskin crews that had dominated the racist skinhead scene for more than a decade. So this is by 2007, the Vinlanders had eight chapters in six states. So it sounds like they had some kind of like fight where they, one of them got arrested. Yeah, so if he was part of Vinlanders, it does seem like they are the more racist Odinites. So that's very uh, alarming there for, you know, what we're trying to figure out. Because you know what I'm saying? There is like an innocent version of Odinites where it seems like, you know, it's not about race. It's about, you know, mythology and whatever. But it looks like he's over there talking about he's a Vinlander. Yeah, that doesn't look good. Here's Patrick Westfall sporting the Vinlanders t-shirt. Uh, social hate call a group. Look, Indianapolis heads appear in court. So their Vinland or social called the trial debt, trial date set for assault of a homeless man. Wow. I don't even know. There's so much to click on. Social club. So it says in 2006, during a national socialist movement event, member Stephen Boswell gave a speech stating the white supremacist movement could not thrive by belonging to a social club where all we do is drink and shoot the shit every Saturday night. Vinlander members in attendance took this as a personal attack on their group and beat and kicked Boswell repeatedly as he left the stage. The incident solidified the Vinlanders' reputation for taking no prisoners. Ooh, three members of the Vinlanders, including founder Eric Fairburn, were arrested in 2007 for severely beating and kicking a black man in front of a large group in Indianapolis. Witnesses claimed the three men threatened bystanders with violence if anyone tried to intervene or call the authorities. Wow. Fairburn was released from prison in 2009 for the assault. In September of the following year, he turned himself into police for the 2004 murder of a Springfield, Missouri man named William McDaniel. McDaniel was allegedly responsible for the drunk driving death of one of Fairburn's friends. Fairburn is now serving life in prison on a second degree murder charge. Vinlander Social Club is still considered a prominent, violent white supremacist group in the United States. In the summer of 2011, the group held their first ever white power concert, Plunder and Pillage in Ohio. 